Welcome back, everybody, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you want to support, you can head over to patreon.com slash toado. You can join the YouTube channel directly, or you could sign up for the newsletter at axum.substack.com. Today, my special guest is Brett Venois of the School Sucks Project. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. So you and I met, and I, I learned about the School Sucks Project project when you were doing your cross-country trip and I know you didn't have the the ravest reviews of my city of LA but I take no <laughs> offense and I I loved uh meeting you and getting to chat with you that weekend was actually my birthday weekend so I, I stepped away for a little bit but for most of the weekend uh I was there with uh your crossover event with Thaddeus Russell's Renegade University could, mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about that journey and uh, if not the, the bright spots of LA, the bright spots of anywhere else along your trip from uh, there and back? Oh, sure. Absolutely. And I feel like I should apologize because I remember meeting you for sure. And I, I was trying to like recall the contents of our conversation, but it happened in a 40 day stretch where I met like 300 people. So I don't know, I could have kept like a better journal of all the interactions that I had. Uh, but yeah, I remember we talked to, to Reason. Uh, we had that big get together at the hotel after that was really an amazing uh, event but yeah i think the 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 story was i felt like i was really living this was 2017 the end of 2017 and uh you know social tensions political tensions were increasing and when we live in those times i mean they're far worse now but they were <laughs> as worse as they had been then you know in 2017 so um i felt like i was really being pulled into seeing the world through a screen right, like Facebook, Twitter, uh, and I understood it was having a negative effect on me emotionally. And I started to think about like, well, what could I do to uh, kind of regain some control of my world? And, you know, fortunately, I've been part of building this great community around the School Sucks Project for, uh, you know, at that point, it had been eight years that I had been doing it. I knew people all over the country and I said, geez, I, I could just travel. I could go and stay with people or stay in hotels. I could go, um, you know, although I could go somewhere. You know, I remember, I remember like it occurred to me that summer, like I don't have to just be here. I could go somewhere. And then Thad, who um, I did the event with, and this is Thaddeus Russell. He has a podcast called uh, Unregistered. He's the author of the phenomenal uh, underground history. No. No, he's not the underground, the renegade history. There's so many various histories of the United States. Thad wrote The yeah. Renegade History, one of my favorite books. Uh, so for a while we did events together, and I think this was our second one in LA, where we would just bring a bunch of people uh, together for discussion on various topics, and it was largely a social event. Uh, so we did one uh, in Los Angeles in, I think it was November, 2017, and he That's actually right. proposed the idea to me. He said, you know, you should drive there. Cause we were like trying to work out transportation. I was like, yeah, that could be my trip. I could spend that time driving to LA and then turn around and, uh, you know, go back the other way after the event. And that's what I did. Uh, so uh, really what I was interested in doing is those, those kind of personal payoffs that I talked about, uh, but also, you know, broadening my horizons as far as seeing what was out there as far as alternative education, people doing interesting projects with homeschooling, unschooling, and, and really just having an adventure. So um, I think, yeah, I was probably complaining about LA. I'm guessing the number one complaint would probably be the traffic. Yeah. And parts of the city to me also seemed like a simulation where somebody had just like copied and pasted uh, a block like for miles. Like it was all the same. There's no, there, was a, there was an experience that I had where I, I went to get my oil changed because I had just driven 4,000 miles. So I went to get an oil change at a place that had, a, you know, had an online coupon and my phone overheats and I know nothing about the city and I need my GPS to get anywhere. And now I have no phone. So I remember like driving around, just trying to see something like a highway. And I was like, I think I'm caught in a simulation. <laughs> I, I think it's just one, like that block. I swear I saw that block two blocks ago. Uh, you know, it was like, store, bunch of residential houses, some palm trees, and uh, I was very confused. So that could have been it, uh, but there were uh, great things about LA too. I thought Venice Beach was amazing, went out to Malibu, uh, went all through the Hollywood Hills, 
yeah, I see what the attraction is to the place. I don't think it's a place I could ever live though. Yeah, I am. I, I was born and raised here, but I've uh, I've spent time away in Washington D.C., in North Dakota, and in Central California, and then a ton of time in Ethiopia over the summers. So I've gotten to see outside, and I definitely, um, you know, I'm, I'm engaged now and, and planning to like start a family. And so, in terms of like getting land and property and all those things, like building a family, I definitely want to do it elsewhere. Um, so it's mm -hmm. it's done enough for me. Um, but yeah, it's time it's time for me to head out, and I'm I'm basically just closing all the the loose ends over the next few years, uh, trying to plan my escape. I didn't go on the great migration to, to Austin like uh, a lot of other people uh, have right. or Florida or some people Atlanta, Georgia uh, as well. But Where do you think you'll go? You know, um, in America, I like, I like Texas and I like uh, Georgia. And when I say Georgia, it's really Atlanta. When I say Texas, it's probably Atlanta or excuse me, Austin or Dallas. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think I would I would love to uh, go to Ethiopia. It's where my parents are both from, and I've never lived there. I've only ever visited. But um, if I can build, you know, a, a secure enough income, which you know I've begun to do over the past few years online, then there's no reason I can't live in Ethiopia. Um, mm -hmm. Now I have a lot of like strong American values, so I don't know if that would clash. So I'd, I'd have to try that out with, you know, six months at a time. I've never been there more than three months, but I've been there many, many times. What do you think the biggest clash would be based on just your experience in both places? The biggest clash is like, this sounds like a silly thing, uh, but in America to find the corruption, and I, I hear a lot about the corruption in DC and in New York, mm. there's like a little bit of a subtle art to it. But in Ethiopia, a lot of times the, the bribery and the corruption culture is so commonplace that it's almost like insulting to someone who's not ready. So, you know, you can get out of a parking ticket for the equivalent of like five dollars US, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it's very like they it's not even very subtle. It's like pay me this and you will get out of this ticket. Um, no courts, but, just bribes. Yeah, yeah, I up. hear that. <laughs> yeah, about uh, countries around the world, actually. It's just like, uh, yeah, this is the part of the procedure where we accept the bribe, if you know about the bribe. So yeah, th yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and so even for like getting clothes. your license at the DMV equivalent, you know, not just like random cops, but like everywhere where you need any sort of official documentation. Mm. Interesting. Okay, well, I mean, it's a way to get things done, you know, and it's nice to know that uh, when you go someplace, because I hear a lot of people, they go to Mexico and they're totally unaware that that's how things work. It's like, why am I being harassed here? It's like they, people just want five or 10 bucks. That's it. Yeah. And especially if you're any type of principled person and mm. you think that, you know, one of your principles are not doing something like that um, or that you think, you know, you're somehow pure of that type of culture that that is you know some of the clashes and then more silly things that again like i appreciated in my short stays but in a longer stay maybe more difficult some areas would have regular power outages like now in texas they're talking about the power outage with all of the cold we're here uh, recording this on uh, february 16th and in ethiopia i remember some of the times i visited like every tuesday and thursday in the neighborhood i would have you know you're not going to have power so, you know, you get your candles and your, your card games ready and your books out, you know, and you just have like conversation. So it's nice because you talked about how you had to weave that into your life kind of naturally. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I, I just find it fascinating. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I also was wondering too, and I don't want to, I don't want to take over the interview and interview you. Uh, I know you have questions for me and we'll get to them. No worries. So how did, how did we come on your radar? Like Thad and the whole renegade history thing and, and school sucks. I'm, I'm just curious, like, was that your first encounter with this world or did you encounter it through something else? So I grew up, uh, a not so typical, but let's say, let's say a civil libertarian Democrat like mm -hmm. Glenn Greenwald, like Jeremy Scahill, and you know what The Intercept was before they had their party. Yeah. And I didn't think a lot about you know, the welfare state. 
And in the 2000, 2008, uh, 2007, 2008 election cycle, I paid a great amount of attention to the Democrat side and to the Republican side. I eventually, I loved the most at the time, Dennis Kucinich and eventually worked for him in 2011 uh, for about four months. That's when I stayed in Washington, DC. But on the Republican side, I had a bias against anyone conservative, anyone Republican. And I came across this character, Dr. Ron Paul, mm -hmm. and he blew my mind uh, because I had all of these biases uh, against, you know, an elder white gentleman and didn't expect him to say the things that he was going to say on foreign policy. And I had no idea what the Federal Reserve Bank was and everything like this. So I began devouring his books and I got involved uh, on campus in an undergraduate with uh, the Libertarian Club. At the time, the president was actually Michelle Fields. I'm, I'm not sure if you oh, yeah, remember yeah, yeah. her. She was a figure in, in politics. Uh, now she's kind of stepped out of the, the limelight, but she, she did write a book on, again, the corruption of DC uh, not too long ago. And, and I think she's enjoying motherhood now, but she was the president of our club. And that, those were her beginnings before she ever you know, got famous from her uh, reporting on Matt Damon and other characters. And the Matt Damon beef, if you remember, was school related. Uh, and, yeah, I, and he yelled at her. Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, and then he, she had the incident with uh, Trump's guard as as well. Um, uh, this is this is where the Ben Shapiro left the Daily Caller because of this incident. Oh, because of the Corey Lewandowski thing, where he supposedly grabbed her. Yeah, 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 yeah. The absolutely. interpretation of that event led towards. Um, her, her now husband and Ben Shapiro and Michelle leaving um, uh, Breitbart rather mm -hmm. uh, yeah, at yeah. the time. Uh, and, and, you know, they all went on to do their own things, obviously. So, but I was aware of that. Again, she was a friend of mine in my undergraduate studies and, and she was the leader of the organization there. I participated in university debate. But if you want to take this all the way back, uh, from preschool through first grade, I'm a Montessori alumnus. Oh, nice. I love yeah. it. Well, I mean, my story was actually, I mean, we're different ages, but my story was actually pretty similar where, um, you know, I, I, I think I had tuned into, there's a radio show in New Hampshire called Free Talk Live. They're really libertarian. I'm and familiar. from there I found uh, my friend Wes's show, Complete Liberty. And from there I found Freedom Main Radio. But yeah. man, it, you know, that seemed like a small and, um, I don't want to say radical, like I had some aversion to being a radical, but I think I did. I think I definitely had a, a hesitation about it. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm really dancing on, you know, landmines with this stuff. <laughs> and then Ron Paul got up and was saying a lot of the same things to these establishment politicians who had clearly never... I, I, at the time, I couldn't tell, like, had they never heard the things that he was saying? Were these just like incomprehensible ideas? Or is that all like an unspoken agreement in Washington not to talk about like U.S. foreign policy or uh, monetary policy? And I think it probably is the latter. I, I think there's plenty of people who are smart enough to understand that uh, the, just the corruption um, in the in the ephemeral, <laughs> even the appearance of these things working is temporary. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know they're happy to kick the can and make it somebody else's problem. Uh, so so I don't I don't know if he was just you know baffling people with what he was saying. I, I maybe it's a combination of the two. Maybe some people just never considered these things uh, just because they're so in the matrix. Um, yeah. But others probably recognized the danger of what he was saying. Like you know when he started talking about why nine eleven happened and Rudy Giuliani <laughs> said, "Hey, you bet that's my bread and butter." That's scaring right. people about Al Qaeda and 9/11. That's my bread and butter. We don't want any demystification happening there. Uh, so yeah, I mean that was definitely a turning point for me too, and and feeling a little bit emboldened at a time where I think I was probably more of a conformist than I wanted to be. That was like you know to 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 hear somebody who had that sort of insider understanding speak a lot of these truths that I had come to realize from this more. Uh, fringe environment that was really um, like impactful and motivational for me as well at that time. Same time. Yeah. Yeah. I had zero interest in economics and he got me to read Ludwig von Mises' Human Action, mm -hmm. which is yeah. a ridiculously long and uses crazy words like apodictic and axiomatic. And I mean, it's a ridiculous book. 
And mm. he got me interested in those subjects. At the same time, for a long time, I've had educators in my family. My mom was a lifelong public school teacher. Her parents were both teachers in Ethiopia. Uh, she was here in the United States uh, before she retired. And so I've always been interested in, in this subject. And I always found it funny that, you know, she was a lifelong public school educator, and yet she sent all of her children to Montessori school. And, and that, um, that, yeah. that difference is one of those things, uh, you know, Corey Dandelis, who, who you've uh, helped, you know, promote a lot as well. I love every time he points out all the people who are anti, um, you know, school choice or anti private school, and yet they send their children, which is like a concept Nassim Taleb always talks about, about skin in the game. Like when people's actual skin is in the game, they act and behave very differently than when they're trying to impose a policy on, on 300 million plus people. Yeah, I really wish everybody in Washington or everybody who's a part of the school establishment would read Anti-Fragile and get that concept, but uh, I don't think that's how, that's kind of a pipe dream for sure. But yeah, no, I mean, I get that. When I read it, I said, well, I mean, it, it, at the time, it was kind of like almost a passe insight that he had because we implicitly understand like these people don't send their kids to these schools. These people aren't relying on this healthcare system, um, you know, to save their lives. Uh, you know, the the access and the privilege that they have uh, really just puts them in a, a, a position where they can say whatever they want. It's the same thing about like Ron Paul speaking up and saying, Foreign policy is not sustainable. Fed printing money is not sustainable. It's like, you know, sorry, dude, we have parachutes to get out of that situation. And normal people don't understand it. So let's just agree to not say anything about it. Um, but but yeah, I mean, that was absolutely, um, I think, a uh, really common phenomenon that you talk about where people work in public schools and then choose for one reason or another, uh, you know, whether it's safety concerns or whether it's the actual content. I mean, certainly there are some people who are true believers Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's pretty common that teachers, uh, people who work as teachers or administrators in public schools send their own children elsewhere. They don't put that skin in the game. Yeah. And as a student of political science uh, who read over a decade ago, you know, Machiavelli's The Prince, mm -hmm. you, you begin to have the Machiavellian insight, which is, it, it seems very basic, but don't take what people say at face value. You know, yeah. look, look beyond what their, their lips are saying, you know, read my lips. I will not raise taxes. No, don't look at their lips, read their actions. And yeah. it's, that, that has been an incredible insight in, in the education space and, and in all of the uh, other spaces. So you want to jump in there? No, oh, it's just, it's such good advice for all of our dealings, right? Judge people by their actions and not their words. And, uh, you know, I mean, politicians, you, you can see how activated they get when somebody, well, like you did that, right? But you said this, uh, they don't like that. It's like, what, how dare you, uh, please just focus on my words. They're magical. You know, uh, we, I mean, we see that all the time. And when that hypocrisy, you know, gets brought into the light, uh, they really don't like it. So, but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's true all the way down to the bureaucratic or the teacher level as well, for sure. They did. And, and, and I know this, but kind of, uh, going back a little and, and encourage you and no worries, uh, for not remembering exactly me. There's a great Amharic saying that the people know the King, the King doesn't know the people. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm crowning you King, but it's, it's, uh, you know, the person who is the organizer of an event, it's so much easier for the people involved in the event, the audience to remember the organizer rather than just, you know, every individual member of the audience and in all the various cities. But we didn't mention where you were coming from, if I'm not mistaken at the time, you're in New Hampshire. And one of the things I've been hearing about for over a decade, well before I met you, was actually the Free State Project, which is why I was familiar with Free Domain Radio and, and a lot of the other uh, projects. I never actually pulled the trigger but it had actually crossed my mind. New Hampshire had crossed my mind. Uh, my sister had went to school out there. And so New Hampshire, New Hampshire was on my mind uh, for a long time. And I knew you had come from there. And when I, after I began following you, one of the more interesting individuals that I saw you highlight, who was a, an educator in his, in his own way. And, and this is why I love all the different forms of education from the tiniest of children through university that you focus on 
was uh, Mr. Rogers and, and the city of Pittsburgh. I even uh, was looking into it so funny, like you even made me look up Pittsburgh somewhere I hadn't thought of. And I looked up like the local jujitsu schools there and there's a, there's a Henzo Gracie affiliate uh, related to uh, John Dana here is one of my favorite jujitsu coaches. There's also Duolingo, which is based in uh, Pittsburgh, but to, to tell uh, my audience a little bit about Pittsburgh as a, as a city and, and you know, what captivated you about Mr. Rogers? Cause I, I think his innovations in, in education were really great. Sure. Yeah. I was back in New Hampshire for most of 2020 and now I'm in Western PA again. I'm not in Pittsburgh. I'm about 45 minutes north of there, just in this old, uh, st uh, some, you know, Rust Belt town. Uh, I'm not sure what the industry was. They made cars here. They made Pullman cars. This is Butler, Pennsylvania. So it's like 40 minutes from Pittsburgh. And I'm in a basement in a bunker, basically. Uh, but I'm here kind of exploring a move back to that area just because I loved it so much. And um, I had a couple friends move out here. Uh, I first came to Pittsburgh when I was on that trip. So like 20 days before I was in LA, I was in Pittsburgh, just having this absolutely incredible time. Um, it, it's an amazing city. Like people have been to San Francisco, the topography is very similar where obviously the city is on the flats, uh, kind of surrounded or near water. And then a lot of the residential areas kind of rise up on these hills and bluffs around the city. So it's, it's very scenic. Um, and it's, it's really culturally diverse and there's, um, you, you know, just amazing stories here about blue collar people, um, uh, taking pride in the kind of work that, uh, in our culture tends to get ignored and, and people really like, you know, there's, there's something that I guess could make us sad about like somebody only ever identifies with the job they had for 40 years and they get their meaning, um, out of that. But, but cultures come from the workways that people have and you know whether it was steel or whether it was coal um th those things produced um a, a kind of ruggedness in in this part of the world um but also you know there's a sincerity here there's a friendliness here there's a, a neighborliness uh like mr rogers uh, lots of great people are from here. Ron Paul is from Pittsburgh. John I didn't know that. Yeah, one of my one of my mentors. Ron Paul was a milkman uh, on one of the uh, the neighborhoods on the edge of town. That's that's where he grew up. So it's a culture that produces a lot of like really special and interesting people. Um, a lot of uh, like <laughs> this is a different category, but Michael Keaton, Jeff Goldblum, they're from Pittsburgh too. And um, th there's a a, a sports scene here that's really great where yeah. people um like in the i've watched amateur boxers there are a lot of amateur boxers from west pa on uh barstool sports the boxing oh, yeah. events they have right so um you know, nearby pittsburgh there's this town homestead and homestead had a baseball team back when they had the negro leagues before they integrated baseball and when you know one of the greatest uh, professional baseball players ever josh gibson played right there and probably nobody while they were watching the pirates and whoever the stars of the pirates were in the 40s and the 50s never even heard of this guy and had he been in the major leagues, he would have absolutely dominated. But I think the presence of the Homestead Grays actually led the Pirates to being one of the first um, teams to sort of like fully uh, integrate and have a really diverse team by the time the 70s rolled around. And baseball being a kind of neighborhood game, uh, you know, they used to play out in uh, out by where the college is and this really like tightly uh, like the stadium that just kind of fit into the neighborhood where it was called Forbes field. And, um, people came together around this team. And by the time they moved down to the waterfront and it was the seventies, they had, you know, the Roberto Clemente, like all of these great personalities. And there was, um, a, a, a real culture around the belonging, um, regardless of who you were and, and where you came from, there was like common ground, with the pirates i would say baseball that's more true than other sports for whatever reason and um there's just so many really really beautiful things visually culturally uh, about this city and and the spirit of pittsburgh is you know be a good neighbor be friendly um it's you know it's not like the rule everywhere you go uh yeah. you might be disappointed here and there but i i remember uh, just coming here and 
really it was unlike it's kind of like the gateway to the polite midwest in in lots of ways and um i just fell in love with it over the course of a couple of months i had friends here so in 2018 i decided to move uh, i lived here for a couple of years i actually left when COVID happened because i wasn't sure how long it was going to take for things to sort of spiral out of control but i thought they would i didn't know what it would look like but i really thought that like a densely populated area even though the part of the city that i lived in was not super densely populated it was kind of like on the way out of the city there was um, a lot of like thinner uh, neighborhoods as far as like you know the density of like houses there was a park but it's still uh, having someplace else to go and being able to go anywhere i just decided to go back to where you know most of the people that i cared most about were um mm -hmm. and i spent most of 2020 there and uh you know now i'm kind of working my way back here i'm pretty sure after i i do some more travel and exploration um but yeah i mean that's the city in a nutshell i'm happy to answer any questions about it yeah, no, it was uh, it, it was fascinating. It, it sounds like a hyper localism, especially the way you describe the kind of the flavor and, and the character of of each neighborhood. But it, it was mostly like like you're saying that focus on neighborliness seems to almost emanate from the the teaching of of children done by Mr. Rogers. And it was mm. just it was it was fascinating how he chose to kind of use the medium of the TV. Uh, you and I are using the medium of, of voice through the podcast and, and you know, video. And, and it's just interesting to me as, as someone who studies teaching in, in various different, you know, there's like a technical meaning of teacher that the state will define with an occupational license. But then there's the, you know, it, in a sense, you're a, you're a teacher, Brett. I don't know if you ever self-identify that way, but like you are a teacher who helps people to to self to become autodidacts to to self-teach, and and that's mainly kind of what I've been taking away from that. But you mentioned John Taylor Gatto, and you had the opportunity to uh, go visit. Was that his old apartment, or what was that place in in New York? I I saw the the image of the van, and you were. You went there, right? Yeah. Speaking of cities, yeah, Manhattan, that's another place. Uh, and things didn't seem to be going so well there, but we know why. We know that the, <laughs> the response to COVID in 2020 and people go, oh, look what COVID did. But I mean, the New York government did that to New York. It's it's a really scary place. It's just basically, um, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time there growing up because I grew up in New Hampshire. It was only five mm -hmm. hours away and it was you know, obviously a destination. Like you go see New York City. But um, yeah, it's just a parade of U-Haul trucks leaving the city that we were a part of that day. So, um, you know, Gatto's story was he, he, very briefly, he was a secondary, or, um, what's it called? Middle school teacher in Harlem, uh, I think in the 70s, the 80s and into the 90s. And um, he had an incredible teaching style that I think was very renegade for the public school environment. There's a great YouTube video people can find called Classrooms of the Heart, where he would basically, I mean, the stuff that he did, he would have been in jail for if he was trying to do it today. He would send kids out into the community. He would pair them up with people doing real things. And he would say, go do something real. Go do something hard. Make meaning for yourself, you know? Like get some get some agency, even though you're only 12 or 13 years old, which is something that was rarely offered then and is even more rarely offered now. So Gatto was given awards like New York City Teacher of the Year, New York State Teacher of the Year. And uh, I think it was 1992, while he, holding this award, he wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal called I Quit, I Think. And said, guess what, everybody? Uh, I have the authority to say so. This is, uh, there's lots of problems here and I'm leaving. Uh, and uh, there's also, there's a video, I think on my YouTube channel, School Sucks Podcast uh, of the same name uh, or John Taylor Gatto's resignation. You could find it. So I kind of dramatized it into a video. Um, but I started working on this, uh, this Gatto video project after my friend Richard Grove had made a documentary where he interviewed Gatto in 2011, I think, and that's called the ultimate history lesson. It's like five hours long. And Gatto, they just go all over the place. It's a it's a real amazing uh, 
exploration. It's the ultimate history lesson. You know, it's an amazing exploration. So uh, I was going to say I watched something, but I definitely didn't watch five hours because I, I I saw the, what you said. I think he did like the apprenticeships on on Fridays. Mm -hmm. I, I had seen some video clip. It must have been clips from from the ultimate history. Possibly, yeah. Uh, it's just the two of them sitting there talking uh, for for most of it, and uh, boy, what an adventure! But I was down there in 2013, and I said I'd like to do something with this. I'd like to like try to get this out to more people in maybe a more accessible and digestible way. So I started just making short videos of little vignettes from Gatto's book, The Underground History of American Education. And one of the questions that we had while we were there and we were going through that is like the book could be better footnoted, right? Like there could be a more complete bibliography for this book. So we actually debated for a while uh, the project of like trying to do that. And there were a few other people involved and it just, it, it never took off. And I really don't think it ever needed to be done. It just would have been a nice kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, backstop if some John Taylor Gatto critic emerged to say, <laughs> where's this guy getting all this? Because he mentions a lot of books and we could go through and find just on archive.org. We probably find all the books he mentioned. I found lot, I found every one that I looked for on archive.org and they're really obscure books written like inter-academic books that were never supposed to be read by the public that this man went and found by picking up a telephone and writing letters and taking car trips. So any of the work that I've done, I've certainly been able to stand on his shoulders and I just have endless appreciation for that. So, um, you know, I passionately produced this series of videos in an effort to, uh, you know, have his message reach more people. Um, he died a couple years ago. And he had this apartment and in this apartment, he had all these books and all these belongings. And uh, I happened to be passing through Connecticut at the end of last year. And Rich and Lisa uh, from Tragedy and Hope, they, you know, they mentioned that this opportunity existed. And yeah, this is kind of a dicey thing right now to take a truck into New York City. Like if anybody told me I'd be going to New York City in 2020, you know, like back in March, I certainly wouldn't have believed them. But there we were in December <laughs> driving this U-Haul truck into the city. And uh, we just decided that it was like a history that we needed to be, uh, I decided they were going to do it anyway, but I decided it was a history that I needed to be a part of. Um, you know, I was still kind of sketched out about uh, COVID and I had mm -hmm. travel coming up and I was just like, well, I don't know. I feel like this is something that I have to do and I'll deal with the consequences later. And, you know, worst case I get sick, but at least I get the story. Like I, it was pretty surreal going into a New York City apartment building uh, at the end of last year, uh, for me, because I spent most of it like pretty shut away and, um, you know, a, a, a big portion of the year taking the whole COVID thing pretty seriously. So anyway, uh, we went and we collected all his books. I think it was like 110 uh, bankers boxes of books. And we took them back to Connecticut and we put them in storage. And I guess at some point we'll slowly go through the process of sorting through it and seeing what's there. Uh, you know, I was, I was watching the truck as boxes of books came down on dollies and I, we, we'd open them and we'd see what was like right on top. And it was a, a, an amazing eclectic collection of, of books for sure. Um, but yeah, that was like a, a really important thing to be involved in. I'm very proud that I got to do that. Uh, cause all that stuff I think would have just wound up in a dump or in a secondhand bookstore where nobody would have appreciated it. And also it would have broken this collection that was in many ways part of this man's identity, you know, like he put those books together. That was his personality and his interests and his, um, you know, academic pursuits that assembled that collection of books. So the fact that it's now in the possession of, you know, friends uh, and people who really valued him and appreciated him, uh, I think is a wonderful thing. And I don't know what will come of it next, but, you know, certainly better than it being in a dump. That's right. And yeah. and probably a lot of the books you mentioned in that kind of critical edition bibliography, maybe he already, you know, had copies of it too. So that might help for anything that may not be at archive.org mm -hmm. uh, to have the the physical copies and, and friends that are actively continuing his legacy. As I kind of told you, uh, before, kind of off camera, my, my big thing and hope for the audience is that they begin to familiarize themselves with what's out there because we saw that John Taylor Gatto spent so much of his career in the, in the public school classroom and doing as much as he can 
to help people think outside outside the box and try experiential learning and kinesthetic learning and what, whatever they need to to learn differently and to begin to to teach themselves and, and learn practical skills for their lives but you know i was i was involved with uh, introducing to my local church community the parents different ideas of micro schooling and homeschooling and small group schooling before the pandemic hit mm. and then the pandemic hit and people obviously have been exploring that thought more and more so i hope they will uh, look towards a lot of your work to to look at that and to learn more about just what are the possibilities out there i i've told people about things like montessori and waldorf which i knew in the past i learned about sudbury and unschooling from you and uh from from other uh authors uh, and, and writers out there as well like uh carrie uh donald as well and her writings and they can look into that in the future. I, I know you have to go soon. So I think another kind of element to this is how people are, are forming these networks and these online communities who aren't even necessarily in school, uh, but who are adults who are continuing their, their self teaching or their, their learning and their education. And I noticed recently you uh, decided to make uh, one of these moves of these spaces to to locals, can you can you talk about the the thought about moving to a space like locals and and what the significance of of that means and th and then we could uh, close out after that if you have anything else to to plug besides the locals. Sure, yeah, I I can actually uh, do all that in in one swift move. I think um, locals I saw as a way to build uh, some community and get some support. Uh, it's like a platform for dissidents, right? So if your community is built on Facebook, you know, you're sitting on this rented land and the relationship is very tenuous and lots of people are telling these stories like uh, my most recent guest, this guy, the honest teacher had a Facebook page with I think close to 20,000 people on it. And he did all these great memes um, and, you know, really kind of like longer form memes that were a little more involved, but I think that's kind of what this this content area calls for. Um, so he had this really successful Facebook page, and one of um, one of the things he was doing on Facebook just disappeared without much of an uh, explanation from Facebook. So um, you know, relying on any of these these platforms, I just don't think it's a good move. I remember I got a video banned on YouTube for like a copyright thing in 2011 or 2012. And um, there was no mediation process. There was at the time, and I was just like, "This is really risky." If people are relying on this for any kind of income, or uh, as a reliable way to speak to their audience consistently, so I think uh, it was time to leave Facebook really on principle. Um, Facebook's not for people like me anymore, you know. And I think that group will expand, but right now I don't feel welcome there. And I didn't feel like it was a good place for our community. Uh, and I felt like I, in recent months, was having to moderate the community more because some of the language that people were using. And, um, you know, I just this is too many people. This is just a collection of people who might not even know that we do a podcast and just like the name School Sucks. So they asked to be a part of the group. And I tried to be careful about who I would let into it. Like, do we have mutual friends? Are they in a thousand groups? Uh, do they have a real picture? Do they have a real name? Uh, you know, are they just, you know, anonymous on the Internet? Because that's really not good for online interactions most of the time either. So um, locals was one place where people could just, you know, if they want updates, if they want to see the, the work we're doing, you know, locals, you join us on locals uh, and you can see that but you can also support us on locals and get access to a whole bunch of uh, bonus content and then um i set up a private community that i think i'm going to expand to ultimately 200 people and that's it that's what i'm going to cap it at and the rationale there is it was dunbar's number 150 plus 50 people kind of compensating for like not everybody's always going to be there some people will be more shy not everybody will always be active so maybe we can push it a little further than that where 
a whole bunch of people have a chance of knowing a good number of other people around a common interest, but then they can even break into smaller groups. So right now we're using Discord. That's not permanent either. Uh, I'm going to probably move this whole community off Discord to another platform called Gilded soon. But the uh, the way people get access to that is we produced a virtual summit in 2019. It was you know Tom Woods, um, Zach Slayback. Uh, Scott Hambrick from Online Great Books, uh, Michael Malice, uh, a whole bunch of people that I thought were like go-to people as far as the ideas they share, as far as the influence they had, and tell us, tell us the attendees of this thing as I, you know, you know channeled through me as I'm the conduit, the interviewer to the audience, saying, uh, "How do you do this? You know, how do you make this work? How do you, how do you assimilate information? How do you present information?" And uh, we turned it into, you know, this three part uh, input process output uh, setup of like how to be a more persuasive person. So we initially built the community around that. And, um, you know, recently I said, I'm shutting down the Facebook group. If people want to stay involved in a way where we can have a two way conversation, this is going to be the way to do it. There's a high barrier to entry. People have to buy into the, the summit. It doesn't cost a fortune, but it's a lot more expensive than joining a Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And um, I also have the ability to be selective and say, you know what? I don't think you're a good fit. Here's your money back. And um, uh, that's how I think, like, as far as doing something, having a community that is action oriented, uh, especially at a time like this, where we need to be um, you know, regrouping and re-strategizing and talking about ideas and supporting each other. Lots of people, I think, have these ideas and they feel very alone in the world with these ideas. So a big part of the, you know, we do weekly discussion groups on Zoom. A big part of it is support. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Facebook groups are 10 years ago and people still have them. And if they work, that's great. But I wanted to do something where I could actually bring people that I wanted to hang out with, uh, you know, into my world in in a more uh, close and connected way so the podcast still goes out to thousands of people and that's great but as far as like the people that i want to interact with it's it's a smaller group but you know people can people can get into it until we reach the cap but um i even sent out invites to like these are the people that i want to be in the group based on you know previous experience people that i knew uh, I've met like most of my social circle at this point is people I've met through the show uh, over the last 10 years. You know, I've been doing it long enough that I've made a lot of friends doing this. So it's like, hey, friends, let's come here and hang out um, and, and let's actually, you know, talk about what we could build or what we could do together instead of just being in some Facebook group. So I, I like that. It's a, it's a great filtration system that you've built and it's at the heart of education from preschool through university that you've talked about is how at each step making it increasingly individualized, increasingly tailor-made and, and custom. I love that. So uh, one final kind of a shout out and we'll let you head out here. Where can everyone find the School Sucks projects if they want to begin listening to the podcast if they haven't already? Sure. Uh, you can just search School Sucks on any uh, podcatcher and you'll find us. Our logo is kind of like a bird. Uh, there, Because somebody else started a podcast called School Sucks, and I think they actually rebranded it. They realized there was uh, a much longer running show with the same name, so they changed it to something else. And um, I thought about messaging the guy and saying, hey, uh, is this really the right move for you? <laughs> um, but I, I think he realized it and changed the name. So search any podcatcher, whether you use Podcast Addict or Dogcatcher, any of those, or, you know, whatever uh, the Apple equivalent is. Uh, just for school socks, subscribe to the podcast. I would say give us three episodes. Scroll through, look for titles that interest you, and um, let's start building a relationship that way. Uh, the website, which is a more comprehensive look at everything that we've done, it's a little bit better organized as far as like topic categories, is schoolsucksproject.com. And uh, this summit, as a gateway to this community, people can find that at SSP university but you just spell that university uh ssp university.com slash ideas into action and people can look at that product all the presenters all the topics and if they're interested and they want to 
um, purchase it, then they get access to this community while supplies last. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brett. This has been uh, amazing. Thank you so much. Anytime. Uh, this was a great conversation and uh, I appreciate you reaching out to me.